spirituality isn't just about meditation or dharma or puja spirituality isn't just for old people spirituality isn't even just about self improvement it's about all these things and so much more the secrets of death the secrets of the universe the secrets of leveling up your mind in life this and more on today's episode with swami mukodanand every 3 months or so we host a spiritual leader on the show and this episode just like our other spiritual episodes was rich was enlightening was calming and was extremely educational remember highlights of this episode are available on prs clips and also remember follow the ranvi show on spotify we're spotify exclusive which means that every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world i will let you slip into this extremely calming extremely spiritual episode with a former iitian now known as swami mukund anand <music> Ji, thank you for being on the Ranveer show, sir. Ranveer, I am delighted to be here and looking forward to today's conversation. You know, uh, before the cameras are rolling, uh, we spoke about something very interesting, uh, and I think it's so relevant to the times we live in, uh, where the world is so polarized. People have such strong opinions about everything. The moment you bring up even the word spirituality. there's a bunch of people out there who have a lot of negative uh, emotions associated with that word they kind of look down upon that word they look down upon people who maybe even are saying that word or promoting these concepts and then there's a massive section of the audiences which honestly i feel have gone through things in life which have eventually led them into spirituality and they love these kind of conversations i remember even myself i was one of those people who laughed at like spirituality and meditation back in college and now we're doing this where you know we're making content around it and it's become such a crucial part of my life and my audience's life so so this conversation for me is so special as with any other spiritual conversation i feel like these are the conversations i've actually started this podcast for so so thank you for being on the show again oh i'm really happy to be here and i look forward to discussing something that is really meaningful and that can add value to the life of the people who are listening uh so so what's your take on this whole um, spirituality angle what is it what does it even mean spirituality brings meaning and purpose in our life as we go through the journey of life we are called upon to make choices in this ethical dilemma what should i choose in this complicated situation what should be my priorities what should i define as the purpose of my life and these questions are so important to everyone now if we don't have a value system to access it becomes so difficult to make these choices so spirituality provides us with the wisdom with the help of which we can establish some values and make the choices that are required mm. and not only that in our daily humdrum existence we get caught up in the process of mundane works earning money paying the bills taking care of the family and we have a need that remains unaddressed mm. the need to connect with something bigger to find a higher meaning behind the mundane works that we do so spirituality helps us connect with something that is bigger than ourselves and besides that spirituality helps us answer the big questions in life now when we go through co- uh, school and college we develop the cognitive intelligence which is iq beyond that some people also develop eq very well where they can understand their emotions they can empathize with the emotions of others and they can master their emotions but the question still remains what is the purpose of my life and if we don't understand that purpose then we are running around like a headless chicken mm. 
So spirituality helps us find the answers to these questions. Who am I anywhere, anyway? Why am I in this world? What should be the goals of my life? And beyond that, Ranveer, no matter how good we may be, we still want to be better. Mm. The urge to improve and be the best version of ourselves is common to everyone. Mm. And what are the tools for self-improvement? Spirituality hands us such wonderful tools that they can completely transform people's lives. Mm. So when it begins to blossom, we get to realize the interconnectedness of ourselves with all of life. And that really makes a huge difference to our happiness, to our effectivity, the quality of our relationships, professional life, self-growth, all this comes into place. Mm. Um, so you said something about purpose right now. I have a simple but complex question for you. Um, is the purpose for everyone the same or is it different depending on who you are? At one level, it's the same. And at another level, it's different. Now, behind everything that we want and seek is the urge to be happy. We all are looking for happiness. And no matter what we decide as our goal, the only reason we strive for it is because we think it will give us happiness. But what is the way to get that happiness? So it is important to define the goals of our life. And that is where people become confused. What should be my goals? So I explained to people that, look, supposing you are having a soccer game where there are 11 players on this side and 11 players on this side, and there are two goalposts, the game is intense. But in the middle of it, if the goalposts are removed, then what remains? Mm. So likewise in life, if we don't have clear-cut goals, then life becomes purposeless. Mm. So the need to define these goals. One goal that all of us have is to try and improve and be the best version of ourselves. So this is a auto-program written in our soul because creation is striving to take us from our mortal imperfection to immortal perfection. Mm. And the whole universe is designed to nurture the soul in that journey and take it to that ultimate perfection. Mm. So the auto program in our soul tells us that I need to be a better child, a better parent, a better citizen, a better engineer, better doctor, better human being. Mm. So until we feel that we have reached, that urge will remain. Mm. So this is one goal, to be the best that we can be. Mm. And beyond that is another urge. We want to do the best that we can do. We want to see that our work is making a difference. It could be in the life of one person, but we want to see the chips flying. Mm. You may have heard that story of the woodcutter. He used to cut wood for 400 rupees a day. And a social researcher went to him and said, I'll offer you 800, double salary. Will you work for me? He said, sure, I want the money. Okay, come over then. So they went over, he said, here is the axe. You will be cutting the trees in my garden, but you will be hitting the tree with the round side of the iron head. The woodcutter said it will never cut. Never mind, you're getting double the salary. 
So he said, all right. Now he went about hitting the tree with the round edge. Naturally, it was not going to cut. And after a week, he came and threw the axe at the researcher's feet. Sir, I quit. The researcher said, why are you getting double the salary? He said, this is no fun. I want to see the chips flying. Mm. Right? You are having this channel. And what gives you the most satisfaction when you see the chips flying, when you see people telling you it's making a difference. So all of us want to do the best that we can do. Mm. And that results in feeling the best that we can feel. So these are the three goals you can crystallize for everyone to be good, to do good, and to feel good. Mm. The details would vary for all of us. Mm. Because everyone's at a different level in their own spiritual journey. Not only a different level, everybody is unique. This world is full of variety. Mm. So for example, no two trees are alike. No two leaves of any single tree are alike. Mm. We have 7.5 billion people on the planet Earth and everybody's biometrics are different. So this world is full of infinite variety. Likewise, each of us has our unique potential. And the way we have evolved over a millennium of lifetimes, we all have different temperaments, different propensities, different talents. So we are all unique individuals and that's the beauty of creation. Mm. So the idea is not to become like somebody else, but to become the best version of your own self. Uh, I'm actually just getting back from a trip from Banaras. Uh, we explored it, we absorbed it. Um, we went to a place called Manikarnika Ghat on uh, the banks of the Ganga where it's, it's basically like an, I mean, for lack of a better way to describe it, it's sort of an ancient crematorium where uh, bodies of people are burned. The one thing I, I noticed about seeing death there was that people didn't have a negative association with death in Banaras for some reason, as in specifically on Manikarnika Ghat. There was emotions flying around, there was sadness, but there was also this kind of strange emptiness. I can't exactly explain or maybe that's the way I absorbed it. So so when I went around asking people, I asked a friend of mine who's very well read, uh, I was told that there's something very humbling about that place, Manikarnika. And anyone who goes there realizes that, you know, this is what your all your efforts, all your goals, all your uh, journeys end with. You end on a funeral pyre. You end being cremated. Um, so my question is one, what do you think of the moment of death? And two, what do you carry beyond death? Like I know, you know, uh, spirituality says that you carry your karma beyond death. But there has to be some other stuff that you're taking beyond. Death is the reality of life. And it's the only thing that is certain in life. That is why they say in English, as sure as death. Mm. And life is literally a dead end because we're going, all going to end in death. So people are disturbed about it because they don't accept, because they don't accept that reality. However, when the sun rises, we know it's going to set one day. And when it sets, we are not disturbed. Mm. So when we see the phenomenon of death, rather than be shocked by it or be troubled by it, we should accept it and adopt it into our worldview. That is what the Buddha did. You know, he was living in a palace in the midst of so much of luxury. And astrologers had told his parents, don't let him see life or he will become detached. So they tried to protect him. But then one day he went out walking and he saw a dead person. He said, oh, so death is a reality of life. I will die one day. And we all know he saw a sick person, an old person. 
So, death is a fact of life. But our scriptures teach us to understand it from the perspective of knowledge. So the Bhagavad Gita says, Vasansi jirna niyatha vihaya navani grihna tinaru parani. Lord Krishna says, Arjun, every day when you wake up in the morning, you take off your old clothes, have a bath, put on new clothes, but you remain the same person. Likewise, death is merely the soul changing bodies. And somebody in knowledge is not disturbed by it. So if actually our body is changing in this life itself, we had the body of a little child, then a youth, then an adult. Likewise, at the time of death, we will again change bodies. So we should decide that it is not something to be disturbed about. But what are we going to carry with us? At the time of death, the gross body is left behind. And there are two other bodies that are enveloping the soul that it carries along with it. The first is Karana Sharir or causal body. It has our sanskars, our karmas of endless lifetimes. And the second is the subtle body. So astonishingly, the mind, the intellect, the ego, these constitute the subtle body, they continue with the soul. So our mind is not of one lifetime. It's coming from past lives. And that is why in childhood sometimes you get the feeling of deja vu. Oh my God, I have seen this before. Why does this seem so familiar? Right? So the French have this term deja vu. And we have an explanation for it. That the mind is continuing from the past. So some of the images, etc. from the past are embedded in the subconscious. Mm. So that is also continuing with the soul. Mm. Um, what, what do you think... Um, what do you think your past was, sir? That you, that you've chosen this life now. It's so interesting. You ask very few people ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I can guess. Sure. As a child, I just loved the hills. There was, it was such a thrill any time I would go to the hills. And that makes me think that I was possibly somewhere in the hills. And then, just share one episode. When I was doing engineering, after engineering, I got admission into a college in Calcutta. I am. That's right. Mm -hmm. So my parents used to go to a numerologist. And he told them that don't let him go to Calcutta <laughs> or he'll take sannyas. They said, you know, he doesn't look like sannyasi material to us. <laughs> so I, they said, they let me go. And <clears throat> things happened there that completely changed my perspective. It did not take time at all. So it made me feel that those sanskars were there. And it was all destined when the time came, that switch got flipped. And I just continued on the journey from there. So what is sannyas for people who don't understand this word? Nyas means to renounce. Okay. Sannyas means to renounce everything. Mm. So this is our Indian equivalent of monkhood. Where we have the student life, where you prepare yourself for the rest of life. And then after that, you enter into household and you want to enjoy a life. And then at the end of the Grihastashram, you decide that the real happiness I'm seeking is not in all of this. So then you start moving towards detachment, towards renunciation to finally take sannyas. But if somebody decides 
from the beginning itself that my goal is not the world, my goal is the supreme. Then the scriptures say that you have that option to take sannyas in youth itself. So there are primarily two streams of sannyas. One are the jnanis. Their sannyas is motivated by this perspective that the world is mithya and unreal. So I'm leaving everything that is unreal and going towards the truth. And the other is the sannyas in the path of devotion. That, that is the sannyas that I have taken, where you don't view the world as unreal or bad or terrible, but you see it from, as a part of the divine. Mm. And you make a dedication that I will use my body, my mind, and my words, everything in the service of the Supreme. So it is not just a question of renouncing, but accepting some higher duties. Mm. What does it feel like? What does this whole process feel like, especially when you begin versus now, after years of, as a person? Yes. <clears throat> well... Ranveer, I would like to express it like this. If I was to go back and choose my career again, never would I choose anything apart from this. And why? Because there's such a strong sense of purpose that I feel I have a purpose and I'm able to align my life my values, my efforts, my profession, with the purpose that I truly believe in. And that gives so much of satisfaction. Any hardships, any difficulties that come, they seem puny and trivial in uh, comparison to that huge purpose that is motivating from inside. Mm. So it's been a tremendous adventure. I first started off as the saying goes, Akele chale the, Rahe manzil pe, Log judte gaye, Aur karama ban gaya. So I started it off as a personal journey. And slowly, it became a responsibility towards society, towards others who look for guidance and for help. And it is a tremendous adventure with so much of potential that I just feel life is a huge opportunity and a huge joy. Mm. And I feel extremely blessed to have this opportunity by the grace of God and my teacher. So, you know, I think one thing people don't understand about a spiritual journey is that uh, especially when it begins or when it starts getting stronger, you encounter tests and the tests could be anything from a lot of people getting cut off from your life, a loved one getting cut off in some form, um, you know, just uh, maybe a very big challenge which is sent towards you. It could even be a lot of power sent towards you to test your will in terms of will you do the right thing or the wrong thing with that power. So, I mean, so while I'm sure that you've had countless tests in your own spiritual journey, um, I'd love for you to highlight one of your recent tests because I feel where you've gotten in your own spiritual journey is so f far down, like that the further you get, the harder the tests get. Therefore, I'm asking about one of the more recent ones that mm -hmm. what's happened lately that you have found maybe for lack of a better word, challenging for yourself or your mind. Right. <laughs> See, tests we can have different perspectives towards it. One is, oh my God, here comes a test. Oh no, I've got to give another test. And the other is, this is an opportunity to come in touch with my weaknesses and to improve even further. Mm. So a student studies hard and the teacher who is teaching gives a test at the end of the year. Now if the student says, no, I don't want any tests. The teacher says, how will you go to the next class, right? So tests are opportunities to progress further. If our value system says that growth is my priority, not comfort, 
So even in that test, we find opportunities for growth. So I think the biggest test is this, <coughs> that so many people look up to a spiritual leader, you know, for the wisdom that the leader is sharing. And it becomes a duty to actually live up to those values, to create integrity within, where we actually stand up to what people are looking us to be. So you have asked me about a recent test. Now, when this coronavirus struck, initially everybody was confused, you know, and people were becoming weak. So, the test was how to keep the congregation strong, how to keep them motivated, how to keep them full of faith. So we just went through it day by day and how to retain faith in the grace of God. And the journey through the coronavirus was very interesting where there were so many realizations on a regular basis. So Following the government rules, I've been able to continue with my travels all the way through. I just came back from a five and a half month visit to the US where I went to 20 cities. So of course, initially, there's a need, a little bit of courage. But then you say, okay, God is great. He's taking care. And then people also, they have the courage to come when the government does allow. So it's been an interesting experience where our faith and the inner strength got tested. Um, so one thing I'd love to know from you is that now one thing I know from doing research on you is that you've, uh, you know, done a lot of yoga in your life basically. And yoga is not just asanas as most people believe it is. Uh, it is an entire lifestyle. It's an entire thought process. Uh, but you've also highlighted Hatha Yoga, which is the physical aspect of yoga. You've <laughs> highlighted meditation, which is a spiritual practice. It's been six years now since I began my own spiritual practices, which began with meditation. I've taken up Hatha Yoga recently as well. And every time I take up a new aspect of yoga, like how yoga has an eightfold part, Ashtanga, every time I take up a new aspect of it, within a month or two, I start seeing some intense things happen in my life. It could be a settling down of my own mindset. It could be added creativity, some new form of creativity that I've never encountered before. Uh, but often, every year, I have these few very intense spiritual experiences. You know, you'll just be sitting and meditating and you'll feel an explosion of light. Maybe you'll feel an explosion of bliss. Maybe you'll feel an explosion of some past memory that you forgot you know, which had probably hurt you really badly, but you had buried it, like in your own mind. You remember that and you kind of let that go. You And you wake up the next day feeling lighter. So again, from that perspective, I've assumed that this keeps happening along the spiritual journey. Like every time that you think it's over and that you think you've reached some sort of peak, it's not even like 1% of everything that's left. So, so if you're comfortable with it, I'd love to know some of your intense realizations or spiritual experiences from recently, considering where you are on your own path, considering how far you've gotten. Um, has there been any experience that's just wowed you? Maybe during an asana, during a meditation? <coughs> the spiritual journey is extremely dynamic. And there are so many things that are beyond material perception. So when we follow this path, we start getting those experiences which are unique to everyone. Some people get more of them, some people get less of them. Because we have all come with different bank balances. Mm. So if you had this much of a bank balance, a little effort gives you more experiences. And somebody needs to put in more effort to reach that point. So the experiences of Everyone are different. And these experiences, I've had a huge amount of them. I prefer to keep them personal. No, no, sure, sir. But at the same time, the experiences, they enhance our faith. 
or sometimes they just they just epiphanies new realizations or certain weaknesses you find they've just fallen off etc but the biggest experience we want to have is what now we may see a light we may hear we may get aromas we may hear sounds that's all very very thrilling but the biggest experience should be that i my mind has become detached and my mind has developed a deep longing for the supreme so the purification of the mind or the imbuing of the mind with divine love that's the experience which is of highest spiritual value so but why are these experiences given to us these aromas these lights these sounds is are these tests like is it given to us to distract us initially when somebody first steps on the path these serve as encouragement so you know like they have beginner's luck where somebody starts something new and that person is lucky because the universe is just encouraging that person to discover his or her destiny here mm. come on here's a lollipop mm. so likewise on the spiritual journey also initially we could get an experience that just fills us with inspiration or strengthens our faith and then later on these could become impediments so there are yogic siddhis when you when your mind becomes focused you you may start developing mystic powers now these mystic abilities could become a distraction because the mind finds them very fascinating and then the mind goes away from the higher goal that was available and that is why sincere seekers say that i don't even want such mystic abilities if god chooses to give it that's a different matter so mystic abilities like what if if you don't mind sharing so <laughs> the bhagavatam states anima mahima murte laghima prapte indriyai prakamyam shruta drishteshu shakte prerana mishita there are eight major mystic abilities and 18 in all so for example to be able to walk on water to become huge like hanuman did or to become very small or to transpolate an object from somewhere or read somebody's mind things like that so these are the mystic abilities uh, maharshi patanjali in his yoga darshan he has gone into the detail when your mind becomes focused you could develop this power and that power and then he ends the whole episode by saying that if you want the highest treasure then reject these lower treasures mm. this conversation is getting amazing and heavy uh it's beautiful so and I, i also feel these kind of messages need to be out there um especially for listeners of this show and just on the internet in general because when i began my spiritual journey these conversations were not there and there was a lack of reference points and i had to go out and find these conversations on the world the certain conversations you end up having with spiritual seekers not just advanced masters like yourself but seekers which just kind of unlock things in your mind and you feel lighter after those conversations you know and that's what we're trying to do through this show as well so where right. i am now having a conversation with you and hopefully people who are listening to this are feeling some kind of buzz in their head um i have a very silly selfish question for you sir which is that uh I notice and I don't know whether it is because of the podcast and having dived into so many minds and having seen everything or it's also because of meditation or it's a combination of the two but why does long term meditation give you the ability to observe another human being so deeply where you can tell so much about them is it because your internal world is calm is it because um you're able to sense the energy of that person is it a combination of all these things that's the one thing i've noticed in myself is it a distraction in my path um uh, it's just a question <laughs> <laughs> yeah <clears throat> i think uh, what you said that it's a combination of everything is very right we all have our auras we all have our energies and as we become a little perceptive as the mind settles down we can tap into those energies you know and we can our sixth sense tells us 
or intuitively we can perceive something about people. And at the same time, when we have resolved our own issues from inside, it becomes easier to assess where somebody else is. So possibly likewise, when we grow in spirituality, we enhance our quality of empathy. So empathy is not just awareness of our own emotions, but an awareness and a compassion for the emotions of others. Mm. And that empathy helps us connect with what people are feeling, where they are, and what they are about, so that we can help them and facilitate them. Yeah. And also, I think the very, very key thing to note here, which has been a massive learning for me, is that don't make everyone's problems yours. Because there's too many problems out there. And when this had started happening to me and I felt the empathy increasing, I started feeling extra bad for a lot of people around me or people I encountered. And it, it was a massive learning curve for me not to take their pain and put it in my heart. That's right. So somebody, we should see ourselves as facilitators. Facilitators means that it's somebody else's journey. We cannot control it. See, parents often make this mistake. They want to control their children's lives. And then when it doesn't happen, they feel disappointed. So a spiritual teacher realizes that everybody's on their journey. People will make mistakes. You give them the best of advice. They may make the mistake a thousand times before the learning happens. Mm. So we have to give people that freedom. Mm. So you just share the advice, make the wisdom available to others, but realize that they will take it at their own pace. We have to be willing to stand back. When we stand back, then we don't get affected. Um, so I have to ask you a very unrelated question. And for the listeners of this particular episode, you'll be like, why is this question even come up? And I have no answer to that. The question okay. just popped in my head. Something I've been studying a lot of lately is astrophysics, which is, you know, the physics of the universe, black holes, the stars. And, and the deeper you get into astrophysics, you realize that the universe is massive. It's just incredibly large. You don't even understand how large it is. If you think it's large, just read a little bit of astrophysics and your mind will be blown away by... Uh, you know, how much more mega it is than you believe it is. Since you've read the Bhagavad Gita, since you've studied it, sir, since you've uh, read all these holy scriptures, uh, does any of the holy scriptures actually talk about the universe as in, you know, outer space, what's out there? Oh yeah, extremely in great detail. So it's so fascinating, Ranveer, the Western world... About 700 years ago, only knew that the earth is flat. And they believed that the earth is the center of the universe. That was the geocentric theory. Then it moved to the heliocentric theory that the sun is the center. And our, the scriptures in our traditions, the name they have for geography is Bhugol. The earth is round. They knew it all the while. And they have explained in so much of detail that there are five mandals, three trilokis, seven lokas. So the first is the Chandra mandal, whose lok is Chandra lok. It is uh, rotating around a mandal called the Bhu mandal, whose lok is Bhu lok, the earth planet. But this Bhu mandal is also not fixed. It's rotating around the Surya mandal, whose lok is Swar lok. And the Antariks, the space in between, is Bhuva. So this Bhu Bhuva Swa creates one Triloki. But the Surya Mandal is also not fixed. Now this I am telling you from these scriptures what they have described 5,000 years ago. Mm. That this uh, Surya Mandal is rotating around Parameshthi Mandal. And the Loka, the planet there is Jana Lok. And the Parameshthi Mandal is rotating around another Mandal, Swayambhu Mandal, whose Loka is Brahma Lok. So all this, now science tells us that like the sun, in the Milky Way, there are a hundred billion suns. You know, and like the Milky Way, there are a hundred billion galaxies. 
which means that there are 10 to the power 22 suns approximately in this entire universe. However, <coughs> now science is talking about the multiverse theory, right? That there are other universes as well. And the Vedas say, you know what? How many universes are there? All of this that you are perceiving is one universe like this. There are infinite universes. And each with one Shankar, one Brahma, one Vishnu. Mm. Can I tell you a little story? Sure, sir. It is said that once Brahma went to meet Lord Krishna in Dwarka. And he asked the gatekeeper, tell Sri Krishna Brahma has come to meet him. So Sri Krishna asked the gatekeeper, tell him which Brahma is he. He asked, Brahmaji was astonished, is there any Brahma apart from me? So he tell him the four-headed Brahma, the father of the four Kumars. The gatekeeper said, Sri Krishna called him in. So Brahmaji on coming, he said, Bhagavan, what was the meaning of your question, which Brahma, is there any Brahma apart from me? So Lord Krishna smiled. By his yoga maya, he called the Brahmas of innumerable universes. And they were all coming and offering their pranams. And our Brahmaji saw that there is one Brahma who's got a thousand heads. Mm. So our Chaturmukhi Brahma said, how big will be his universe? Mm. And then there was one Brahma who had one lakh heads. And one Brahma who had one crore heads. Mm. And one Brahma who had one Arab, one billion heads. So, Dekhi Chaturmukhi Brahma Hailo Chamutkar Krishna Charaneyasi Karilo Namaskar. Our Brahmaji fell at the feet of Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna said, Brahmaji, there are infinite universes. Yours is the smallest. That is the extent of God's creation. And all of this is one fourth of creation. This is the material realm. And beyond this is three fourths which is the spiritual realm, where this maya, this kal, this karm cannot go. So that is when we say God is great, that's how great he is. What's out there in the three-fourth? It's indescribable. Because our words can only compare with the glories of what we see here. Mm. Right. Now let us say that we wish to give a comparison. We will give it with material things. And that is made by a different energy. So this material realm is made by an energy called Maya, the material energy. And we see the, so much of glory in every aspect of material creation, you know, from the tiniest Higgs boson to the biggest galaxies. To Cristiano Ronaldo. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. If there's glory manifesting in everyone. To Sachin Tendulkar. So, now, all of this is glorious. Imagine the glory of Yoga Maya. When the computer revolution started, one college boy came up to me and said, Swamiji, what computer does God use? to keep an account of our karmas. So I said, you know, a computer is made by the material energy. And God has a superior energy called Yoga Maya, by virtue of which he knows everything that we thought of from the time we were born till today. Not of one lifetime, but our infinite lifetimes. And not one soul, but infinite souls of creation. So how does God manage to do all that? By his yoga maya. By that yoga maya, he creates his divine abode. So let it suffice to say that it is sat, chit and anand. It is eternal, full of bliss. Now can you imagine objects made of bliss? Mm. And sentient consciousness. So that abode is sat, chit, anand full of divine bliss. It's for the perfected souls. 
That means when we reach that perfection, we will then be there. Can you become imperfect when you go there if you fail a test there? Once we are situated in knowledge, then the ignorance will not overcome us again. Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Sada Pashyanti Suraya. It's that the soul is on a journey. You know, so in the journey, we are slowly growing and we're taking a few steps ahead, maybe a few steps back and then again a few steps ahead. But once we reach that perfection, it means that now we are situated in knowledge. So when you have divine bliss, then why should you choose something far inferior? Yeah. Something I want to highlight is this concept of Satan that I've been reading about a lot lately. Uh, different cultures call it different names. The devil, uh, you know, evil, darkness, dark energy. What people fail to understand is that just like light, even dark energy is within everybody. Uh, and Satan is within everybody. The devil is within everybody. It's just about the proportion of the light versus the dark inside you that actually causes you to think in a certain way or act in a certain way. Or uh, be calm versus be, you know, an overthinker. Be... Uh, positive versus be negative, be afraid versus be brave. Um, I'd love for you to highlight that because that's what I got from what you just said, sir, that once you go beyond a certain point, uh, you let go of ignorance. I think what uh, you termed as ignorance can also be a part of this dark energy within everyone's minds. And I'll tell you where this is coming from, sir. Yes. Um, what we're trying to do through this podcast, I've always felt, and I know even my closest teammates are all in that same mindset. We put it out with a lot of positive energy. We put it out to spread healing, to spread laughs, to spread good intent. Um, and that's what's given us material success. And that's what's given us numbers and everything that we've gotten. Now, there's a lot of people who are looking at us where we are right now without understanding the six-year journey we've been on. Someone who's followed us from the beginning understands the things we say now. But someone who probably sees us now doesn't understand why we're saying what we're saying, or why we're talking so much about the things we're talking about and makes a lot of assumptions about us. So, you know, in interviews, when we are interviewed as YouTubers, we often get asked, does hate affect you? So hate doesn't affect me, but hate definitely creates questions in my mind in terms of why are these people thinking like this? Like one of the words associated with me a lot is pseudoscience because I, I have questions like these, like the questions I've asked you. And I'm sure that word gets thrown at you as well. So I went and asked a spiritual friend of mine that why is this happening? You know, what am I doing wrong? Is it something I need to improve within myself? And that person told me that, hold on, understand the concept of Satan first. And understand this concept of the balance of light energy and dark energy. So one of the outcomes of increasing the light energy within yourself is that all the other dark energy in the world will try pulling your light down. And that dark energy is already within these so-called haters' is mind or these so-called critics' is mind or these doubters' is minds. And possibly their dark energy is not liking the amount of light and positivity you're spreading in the world. Which is why it manifests as people which are like trying to pull you down, which go out of the way to sabotage your career. Uh, and you have to just accept, flow with it, also forgive. You need to understand that it, in many cases it may not even be those people themselves. It could be their past experiences which have manifested as dark energy, which is trying to now uh, pull away your light and pull away your positivity. So the key is to not get affected and keep doing your thing with laser sharp focus. And that's what's worked for me. But I'd love for you to highlight, uh, I don't know, this conversation a little more. So, so uh, Ranveer, when we bring in the concept of Satan, then the world becomes extremely complicated. Because there's this being from which a whole lot of hatred is coming. And if we say that there is an all-loving creator, then where did Satan come from? Who created Satan? And if that creator made Satan, then the question arises, why did he make Satan? Right? So, as per the Vedas, there is no such Satan. There is the material energy, Maya. Now that material energy, we can say, is trying to trip us. It's making us angry, desirous, greedy, proud, etc. So these are all the, the, the soldiers of Maya. 
that are within us that are within the others and also externally they are, they exist and you can put them in your bodies sure so but the point is <coughs> that maya also is not an enemy as such it is also an energy of god so from our point of view everything is connected with that one and that is why sometimes the scriptures say Ahameva sameva gre nanyadyat sadasat param paschadaham yadetacha yo vashishet so smeham. In the Srimad Bhagavat, Lord Krishna tells Brahma that Brahma ji, when creation did not exist, I alone existed. Everything that is existing in the form of creation is my expansion because the energies are coming from the energetic. like the fire emanates the heat and light so they are one with fire so all these energies are my expansions where creation ceases to exist beyond that what is there i exist and when creation will be dissolved i will remain so there is nothing apart from me that material energy does seem to be opposing us but the little known secret is that it's actually facilitating our journey forward and our growth and our growth mm-hmm. so very often now to find people hating you is a very common phenomenon because everybody wants to be successful but nobody wants to see the success of others so if you become too successful you will live woke the envy of the others and then people have their perspective now if you go two steps ahead of them you become a visionary but if you go 50 steps ahead of them you become a martyr they want to kill you right so that kind of opposition is natural but self growth means that we remain unaffected by this mm. so self growth doesn't mean nobody hates me and that's why i am normal self growth means that people are opposing and yet we have the maturity and self control to remain normal mm. so our effort should be that people are as they are how can i rise above this you know i sometimes you may have seen this phenomenon of the crows getting after the eagle so the crows they do dive bombing of the eagle although the eagle is much bigger Now the eagle doesn't fight back. The eagle just goes higher and higher and higher until the crows give up. So likewise, when people say bad things, etc., you go within yourself and find your spiritual wisdom to handle that situation and to rise above it. Mm. I love what you said about the eagle, sir. And I think there's a lot of people who actually relate with that. what's the spiritual significance of the sun and the moon sir and is there spiritual significance of the sun and the moon according to the scriptures they have a significance in terms of their impact on human life okay. so you know from the point of view of astrology all the planets they have their impact so the sun and the moon also have their impact now for example there are mood swings with the moon mm. so the mind has a very strong connection with the moon mm. and that's why the waxing and the waning moon does affect the mind mm. so likewise if the sun dominates it has its own uh, impacts etc so these impacts are more on the material side or on quasi spirituality So there's one quasi spirituality which includes astrology, numerology, palmistry, etc. What is the meaning of the word quasi? Quasi means semi spirituality. Okay. You know, but uh, if we if we go into pure spirituality, then you can rise beyond all of these. Mm. Because ultimately our mind is our own possession and things can influence it a little bit. but finally what we choose to think in any situation is always a decision that we can make so that is why a good spiritual practitioner would be one mm. who in negative situations under negative influences 
can still be perfectly calm, perfectly peaceful, and having holy thoughts residing within. That's what we should strive for. You know, there's this very interesting part of the autobiography of a yogi that um, talks about astrology and the nature of it, where Yoganand Paramahansa explains astrology in detail. He's also who I consider to be my guru. So again, I've I, read the book. Okay. I'm sure you have, sir. Um, he he explains astrology from the perspective of, for lack of a better word, I think spiritual vibrations or electromagnetic vibrations. He says that especially the planets in our solar system and our solar system in general uh, gives out a certain amount of uh, electromagnetic radiation. In the same way that uh, light has dual nature where you have photons as well as waves, uh, every object in the world has a certain amount of energy that it's always emitting. Like these cups of coffee or the coffee itself has a kind of energy it's emitting. And the larger the object, the larger the energy that it's uh, emitting. So say a planet like Saturn, which is so big, or a planet like Jupiter, which is so big. Imagine the heap of energy that it is emitting, or even the moon by itself, you know, which is so close to the Earth, the energy that's emitting, or the sun and the energy that's emitting. These are the energies that um, can affect human beings based on their own past karma, their own sanskars. Uh, and then he goes on to say that the moment you go into deep meditative practice and spiritual practices and you keep making your inner core stronger, like in the world of weight training and the world of sports, we keep talking about core strength because whether you're throwing a punch or kicking a ball, it's about core strength. Similarly, in, in the world of spiritualism, um, your core strength is how much you meditate, how strong is your faith, how strong is your bhakti, how good are you as a person. The stronger your core, the lesser you get affected by those energies. And the more you get carried by the goodness of the universe. But, uh, sir, in this whole paragraph, would you like to add anything that I've missed out on? So when we talk about core strength in spirituality, it is our control over the mind. This mind is the most important aspect of our personality. And is the mind what gets affected by those energies of the planet? That's right. Okay. See, happiness and distress is not a consequence of the circumstances around us, mm. but a consequence of the state of our mind. So the Western philosopher John Milton, he put it so well. He said, the mind is a place of its own and can make happen a heaven out of hell and hell out of heaven. You know, so we are always focused on changing our circumstances. I want to move to a better place. I want to have more opulences in the hope that the circumstances will give us happiness within. But spirituality teaches us that your inner state is more important than the outside. And if you can fix that, you can be happy wherever. And that is why the Bhagavad Gita is spoken on a battlefield. Now, that is the worst situation of this material realm. You can't go worse than a battleground. You know, everything is agitated and disturbed. And even there, Lord Krishna tells Arjun, you can be perfectly calm and peaceful. So, the message is so strong that the real peace that you want is an inner state. And if you can make the core strong, that if you can learn the control of the mind, then you become insulated from the outsides. So a beautiful definition of yoga is given, yogina karma kurvanti sangam tyaktvatma shuddhai. A yogi is one who is doing worldly works. The yogi may be a king, there were so many kings in the past, maybe an administrator, maybe anybody is doing all the worldly works, but is still completely calm and peaceful. So for that, we need to learn the science and the art of mind management. Mm. But that is what spiritual teachers like Swami Yogananth were teaching us. Mm. And you know, I think that mind management and mind balancing happens from the world of yoga. And again, when I'm saying yoga, I don't mean just the asanas. It's the eightfold path. 
which possibly begins with the physical, which are the asanas and then heads into meditation and your thought processes. Um, so maybe to end this particular episode, I'd love for you to highlight yoga, yoga in people's lives because it's that one lifestyle factor that can actually fix all these things. Everything we've spoken about on this episode basically boiled down to balance and faith. Balance your inner world, have faith in your inner world. And these are both the outcomes of a yogic lifestyle. So for someone who doesn't know anything about yoga, who has just kind of started exploring, what would you like to say about yoga in general, sir? In the Yoga Vasisht, <laughs> there's a conversation between Bhagwan Ram and his Guru Maharshi Vasisht. So Lord Ram toured his kingdom and he found that people are sick. They are affected by vyadhi or disease. He came back and he asked his Guru, Maharshi Vasisht, Ki Guru Dev, what is the cause of disease? So Maharshi Vasisht gave a very insightful answer. He said, Ram, disease begins in the mind, the Manamaya Kosh. When we harbor negative thoughts, poisonous thoughts, the mental sheath gets disturbed. And that disturbance in the mental sheath gets passed on to the pranamaya kosh, the vital energy sheath. And when the vital energy sheath is out of balance, there's more energy going somewhere, less somewhere else. It manifests in the anamaya kosh, the grass body, in the form of disease. So the yogic system is aiming at our holistic health. It says that you need to keep your physical body healthy because the body is the vehicle for your journey. Sharira madhyam khalu dharma sadhanam. Now you know so much about fitness. You need four kinds of exercises to be healthy. You need the stretches and the flexes. You need the aerobics for muscle strength. You need the cardio to work your heart. And if you can also add to it balancing postures, particularly in old age, or inverted postures to nourish your brain, that would make a perfect mix. So the, the yoga, yoga asanas that were presented in Hatha Yoga by Swami Swatmaram, etc., they have a complete mix of all of these. So it is so amazing that they understood our physical body so perfectly. Now somebody has backache, they go to a physiotherapist and the physiotherapist tells them the exact exercises that were taught in our yogic system thousands of years ago. But then, this physical asans is not enough. You need to address the vital energy sheet. Right? And for that, we have the pranayam. Now, Baba Ramdev brought about a revolution. He emphasized the pranayam. And pranayam is said to be even more important than the yoga asans. Because it is addressing your cellular health. There are 37 trillion cells in your body. And pranayam is nourishing all of them. But then we have to go beyond to the mind. Now if the mind is not addressed, it will again then undo everything else that was done. And that is why in holistic wellness we say that you need to be a positive thinker, be optimistic. And that is where meditative techniques come in. That give us tools for managing our mind. But then, these are only three koshas. The Annamaya Kosh, Pranamaya Kosh and Manamaya Kosh. There is another Kosh beyond this, which is Vigyanamaya Kosh, the intellectual sheath. The mind will only be controlled when the intellect holds right values. If the values of the intellect are skewed, then you say, okay, control your mind. So how will I control my mind? My mind is hankering for this and hankering for that. So to improve the values, we need wisdom. And that is where this sacred wisdom, divine wisdom comes handy. And there's one final sheath called the Anandamaya Kosh, the bliss sheath. 
ultimately it's all about happiness we all want happiness and where you decide happiness lies your life starts veering in that direction so we have to discover happiness within ourselves and not be like the kasturi deer you know the kasturi deer has the kasturi inside and it's running around outside for the kasturi not realizing it's within so likewise we are hoping that the outside things will give us happiness but like i had told you in the beginning of our episode that secret of happiness lies in improving yourself from inside so when you try and be good and do good that is the secret to feeling good so yoga is an integral wellness system which is addressing all these aspects of our personality sorry mukunanan ji thank you uh this is a fantastic episode um you know it's episodes like this spiritual conversations like this which enter my life in moments where i really need them um so much i've gained from this one no it's not just the peace and it's not just the answers i got to my own questions it's not just all the stuff you've shared all the information you've shared uh it's sort of this unspoken about energy that i just end up exchanging with my guests and it's an absolute honor to have you on the show speak to you uh and i hope now you understand why i didn't speak to you much before the camera started rolling <laughs> so absolutely uh, ranveer uh, it's been a pleasure uh, i consider it a privilege <coughs> bestowed on me to have opportunities to share whatever wisdom has come my way and i am thrilled yes. to be with you in this conversation and exchanging wisdom no no i it's much less of an exchange than it is just a gift from your end to us so it the privilege is ours and uh, hoping to do more episodes with you uh, going forward so because as i have got to know recently even god is a being that is constantly evolving so what are we you know we are on our own evolutionary paths and i'm sure if i even meet you a year from now even your wisdom would have like uh increase just a little bit so really hoping to have you on the show again sir and create more with you definitely ranveer it will be my pleasure to have uh, many more such interactions i look forward to that thank you sir but me before we end this episode uh, is there any advice you have for me sir any advice for you yes you have found reasonable success professionally and you have honed your intention to make it more altruistic where you are trying to make a difference through the works that you are doing keep your resolve firm when you see other people doing differently and getting more success don't be swayed that you know maybe that was the path to happiness yeah. i am telling you what you are doing is the right thing but to do it more effectively what do we need we need to try and improve our own selves see in this journey the biggest obstacle is not from the outside it's always from the inside the stupidity within our own selves so we need to work hard in our profession but we need to work harder on our own selves yes so so keep on working on yourself and you'll do better and better in your work my best wishes to thank you. thank you sir there has been this thought in my head of why didn't i begin building businesses earlier in life like why did i do content creation for so long uh and you've just answered that question <laughs> for me i've been comparing myself to business folks who started when they were 21 22 and i didn't do that i, st- I started it later in life so see ranveer when i took to this path i was what's your age okay now why 28 i'm <laughs> okay i took sanyas at the age 23 <clears throat> and my classmates in iim they thought he's gone crazy what's wrong with him 
he is just talking about spirituality all the time those the young minds could not understand this but i was firmly convinced and then slowly the world turned around completely and now they come to me and they say what is the goal of life can you please help me understand it <laughs> right so be firm in your resolve uh, that is one of the most important things thank you sir bow down to you and thank you from the bottom of my heart sir thank you that was our episode with swami mukundana and obviously if you've reached this part of the podcast you were completely gripped because you perceive spirituality in the same way that i do like a massive infinite never ending library of knowledge astrophysics is a part of it mysticism is a part of it death is a big part of it and of course swami ji will return on the ranveer show please tell me what you thought of this particular episode also tell me what else you would have liked me to ask swami mukundanand with these spiritual episodes i usually just ask the questions that i have at that point in time you know the questions that build up every 2 or 3 months that you don't have answers to i save them for these kind of spiritual episodes of course we're going to be creating more spiritual episodes we've also done an episode with swami mukundanand on our hindi podcast so check that out but as for this podcast follow us on spotify every episode of the ranvi show is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world lots more feel good episodes of the ranvi show coming your way stay tuned for the 2022 version of the ranvi show mm-hmm.